Welcome Classic Rock Friends to one of my ranking videos, Worst to Best. And yes, we've finally gotten round to it. We're going to look at the albums of Genesis. Before we do so, I'll urge you to click like, subscribe and check that notification bell so as not to miss out on any uploads. And if you've got a moment, please do check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the sterling work done here at Classic Album Review. So with no further ado, let's get on with it, shall we? Number one is Calling All Stations from 1997. This is an album that usually languishes at the bottom of such lists. Dismissed by the Chicago Tribune as a formless blob of synth sounds. Even Tony Banks as late as 2019 has said that he regrets this album's lack of uniformity. Certainly what I regret about this album is that, that it's generally a missed opportunity. And this album sees this band wrestling with what's best described as a kind of an identity crisis. Hoisted upon the petard of their own indecision. And I put this down to Banks and Rutherford being unable to commit to a, a firm musical direction. Many of these songs desire a return to a more prog sensibility, which I certainly welcome. But at the same time, they're not willing to sacrifice any of that pop accessibility. And therein lies the rub. Ray Wilson is a great singer. His voice possesses that almost Gabriel-esque purr rather than the uh, soulful belt of Phil Collins. And there's some interesting numbers on here, Alien Afternoon, there must be some other way, The Dividing Line, and even Congo with its tribal atmospherics is a standout number. Banks has interestingly said there's uh, quite a few numbers, very good numbers in fact, that were left in the can. One has to wonder if not if there's a whiff of a deluxe edition just up the road. Number 14 is We Can't Dance from 1991. The Knights of Prog transmogrified to the Masters of Pop, wrote one commentator. This album has all the gloss of 1986's Invisible Touch, which is an incredibly good 1980s album, which is a bit like damning with faint praise, isn't it really? This is the band's 14th LP, which didn't do as well as its predecessor. Nevertheless, it sold millions of copies, no doubt pleasing the Fair Isle Sweater Brigade. And Collins leaves uh, to dedicate himself to a solo career, leaving Banks and Rutherford. Uh, deciding to do one more album under the Genesis moniker. It's a fairly uneven album of catchy pop rock tunes and some semi-progressive numbers and the obligatory syrupy balladry. Invisible Touch was a fairly upbeat album whereas the tempo in this one is, is more chilled, lending an interesting atmosphere to the proceedings. Interesting uh, and some great numbers on this as well including We Can't Dance, uh, No Son of Mine and of course uh, Jesus He Knows Me their swipe at tele-evangelism. I find the themes explored on this album rather intriguing as well, themes of uh, lost love and fading memories, as well as a bit of political spleen over the state of the world. I must admit I rather like the artwork on this as well. The artwork was by uh, Felicity Roma Bowers, but the inside picture of a rather glum looking Genesis after the party is um, rather revealing, I think. Number 13 is from Genesis to Revelation from 1969. Most of the tracks on this were demoed between 67 and 68, I believe. Uh, demos recorded um, over several sessions, orchestrated by Jonathan King. The album was recorded in just three days in August uh, 68 at Regent Sound Studio B in Denmark Street, just off the Charing Cross Road. This album really uh, just serves as a, a curious piece really that predates the brilliance of trespass and nursery crime. Fans of the more pop orientated Genesis have never heard of it and fans of their proggier stuff generally don't care for it much. And Jonathan King is partly to blame for this rather unimpressive result, feeling that they should record an album after two very low charting singles. And King had his hand in certainly the recording process suggesting that the band compose songs based on its very biblical theme. Um, clarifying the origin of the band's name perhaps. And although this is uh, an intriguing album, it's certainly a tad dreary, that's for sure. Peter Gabriel gives very little indication of the vocal prowess and extravagance that was to come, and likewise the band show very little of their um, musical talents, it has to be said. This is a curious old relic that's worth dusting off now and again, if only to perhaps look for uh, the brilliance that was trespass and nursery crime just on the horizon. You have to look bloody hard though. I suspect this album claims its place on, on these type of lists higher than perhaps it should be simply because of the involvement of Peter Gabriel, Rutherford and Banks. Um, kind of misplaced reverence uh, regarding this most biblical of albums. Number 12 is Abacab from 1981. 
Genesis here could perhaps be accused of capitalizing on the fading relevancy of prog at this juncture and perhaps placating an audience that we're looking for something a bit more melodic based on sound musicianship, especially after the snarl of punk had begun to fade, replaced by the heroin chic and craft working beeps and bloops of the new romantics. The LA Times praised this album for its thick, resonant instrumental passages, quaint imagery in the lyrics, and superb production. And I must admit I'm inclined to agree with them. Although I'm a bit suspicious that the direction of this album was perhaps informed by the success of uh, Phil Collins' face value. You have to wonder, don't you? Although Banks vehemently denies this. You consider an album like Duke, it's a wonderful combination of uh, prog on pop in many ways, combining upbeat melodies with, uh, you know, the adventurous spirit that defined progressive music in the 1970s. But Abacab is unashamedly buried balls deep in the 1980s as they distance themselves from the festering carcass of the previous decade with the three day week, the winter of discontent and men in capes. That's not to say this album lacks any uh, bold experimentation. I love the title track, but overall it's a punchy album with uh, swirling synths, uh, guitar hooks and choruses and melodies. I love Dodo and The Lurker. It's an epic number featuring some wonderful organ thrum. And Tony Banks uh, said this album brought radical change. And a lot of it works very, very well. I mean, I really enjoy the R&B textures of uh, No Reply at all. And the wonderful atmosphere of Keep It Dark but I understand that it's not every fan's cup of tea. Number 11, and then there were three from 1978, following the departures, of course, of Peter Gabriel and then Steve Hackett. It's argued that this band then lead into their most profitable, uh, certainly com commercially viable epoch of this band's existence. This album is a kind of a bridge, really, between the prog meanderings of Wind and Wuthering to the more pop-infested Duke album. Many view it as a an unsteady merger between the band's artistic and commercial aspirations. The album's strongest moments is when the pop and prog stuff work together seamlessly and seamlessly well, it has to be said. Burning rope balances the two nicely, revealing some classic Genesis passages among the, the catchy melodies. And the band's characteristic storytelling is very much upheld in uh, The Lady Lies with that opening swirl of keyboards, which I, I just adore. And I also enjoy the chaotic rhythm of Down and Out, which recalls some of the more uh, frantic moments of The Lamb. The main criticism of this album, really, for me, is uh, I find the production a little bit muddy, which means a lot of these tracks uh, lack uh, impact or punch in the mix. And number 10 is Invisible Touch from 1986. Rolling Stone lauded this one, stating that every tune is carefully pruned so that each flourish delivers not an instrumental epiphany, but a solid hook. And this was uh, a time when Collins' star as a solo artist was definitely in the ascendancy, eclipsing their, his former band, I think. And many have labelled this as a kind of an unofficial Phil Collins album, although I don't, I don't agree with that. Nevertheless, I'm sure that the success of Collins' solo career contributed to this one being perhaps Genesis' best-selling album. I think it is their best-selling album. Replete with catchy pop anthems, tender love ballads that were just so 1980s. Chinos and mullets abound. The tracks are very much defined by keyboards and synths with programmable drums, not leaving a lot of room for any guitar bits, which are, seem to be kept at a minimum. It's, I think it's fair to say that Genesis at this juncture are only half the band they used to be, quite literally. And there's certainly a far cry from the band that uh, composed Watch of the Skies all those years ago. Nevertheless, this is a decade-defining album, or maybe it's an album defined by the decade you choose. And the vocal hooks just hang with you, whether it's uh, Phil Collins singing about women with an invisible touch or throwing it all away or in too deep. Uh, Phil Collins' 80s soul man really delivers on this. And I don't say that to downplay the contribution made by the other musicians, all three musicians are exceptional on this album. I love Land of Confusion and Tonight, Tonight, Tonight and Domino, which I think passes the eight minute mark. My word, it's as if the ghost of Prague is rattling its chains from the margins. This is an album that's very much a product of its time. Uh, in, a, in the words of one critic, uh, it was an album created by a band that realized playing by the new rules was a better idea than stubbornly sticking to the old ones. Admittedly, you know, this album's a bit of a, an anathema for those clinging to the lamb, but it's a glorious album for those who see it as a, um, a period piece 
and enjoy it for what it is because I think it's fabulous. Number nine is Genesis from 1983. Now this one often features fairly low on people's lists. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm tempted to rate this a notch higher because I love this album so much. And the reason I love this album is it's just infused with so much sentimental value for me. Uh, it's an album my brother used to have on vinyl and we used to play it to death. I absolutely adore this record. Um, it's a, a beautifully crafted pop rock album with faux Mexican moustaches. What more do you want? Interestingly, Kerrang said of this that uh, uh, its genesis have traded technical complexity and ingenuity for an altogether more stunning simplicity. I love the menacing electronica of Mama with its eerie synths and um, desperation laden vocals uh, before we move to the um, to the to the bounce of that's all a, a Beatles inspired number if ever there was one. Interesting for Mama, Collins wanted to emulate the reverb drenched vocal of John Lennon on his Bebop Lulof, his rock and roll album. And also if I may quote Wikipedia, um, the, the laugh was influenced by the 1982 song The Message by rap band Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, which has a similar sound. There are lots of obligatory ballads on here, taking it all too hard. Uh, to the plain silly, of course, a legal alien with uh, Phil Collins now somewhat uh, inappropriate, a faux Mexican accent. But the best piece on this record, I mean, Mama is fantastic, of course, but the best piece is the progressive Home by the Sea. Um, this song still gives me uh, absolute chills. That includes Second Home by the Sea. Uh, this idea of um, beautiful vocal hooks in part one, this idea of walking through this haunted house to the... Um, instrumental stretch uh, on the second part. And the aforementioned uh, Illegal Alien is an interesting blend of sort of electronic percussion um, stuffed with some Caribbean and reggae motifs as well and taking it all too hard as a great vocal on it. Uh, just a job to do gets a little bit too Miami Vice for my tastes but nevertheless I um, deeply love this record. Number eight is Duke from 1980. Now this album was praised for the band uh, uh, bridging their more progressive rock orientated past with their more pop rock orientated direction. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the their first number one album in the UK. Rolling Stone said that the album possessed a refreshing urgency. If and then there were three, it suggests that Genesis was moving towards a, a more commercially accessible material. Duke sees the band jump arse first into the fray of an album uh, peppered with pop tunage. Yeah, it's sufficiently proggy enough to uh, uh, keep the real ale drinkers and beard strokers happy, I think, the Genesis faithful, especially with the Duke suite. A suite described by BBC Music as modernist art rock. However, this album is a million miles from the hymnal selling England by the pound. Nevertheless, it's a major step for a band that was redefining itself with numbers like Misunderstanding and the arena rock anthem of Turn It On Again. Duke is an album, it seems, where pop and prog uh, cohabit together rather harmoniously, I think. And the band looked over the sprawling topography of the 1980s from a rather advantageous, uh, commercially speaking, that is, and profitable vantage point. I love the themes of this album of failure, of extinction, that seem to course through the record. Uh, you know you're on the way out, cul-de-sac, uh, very much do uh, a great deal to set the mood of this record, uh, the mood of this record, which uh, in part had to be influenced by Colin's uh, disintegrating marriage. In fact, Please Don't Ask addresses that very issue. Biographer Ray Coleman said the song is a searing mixture of a love letter and a lament for the loss of his children. Interestingly, one song rejected uh, for the Duke album was um, a film number we've probably never heard of called uh, In the Air Tonight. Duchess is another fascinating one about a protagonist whose popularity creates a rift within her own personality. And the lyrics feel like insights uh, underlying the emotion that informs this record. And the music on this is excellent. Of course, you get Colin's syncopated drumming and a newly found vocal prowess. Uh, Rutherford and Banks, the guitar synths and keyboard textures are fabulous. And if I'm not mistaken, Mike Rutherford assumes the role of bass player on this album, which provides a fantastic uh, rhythm section. The band at this juncture seem to be fearing their waning relevance, and Collins, of course, his waning marriage. Uh, standout track on this has to be, uh, standout track or tracks has to be the Duke Suite. 
Number seven is Trespass from 1970. This album sees a band breaking free from the original producer and taking creative matters into their own hands. Trespass is a transitional album. This, this band's got quite a few transitional albums, I think, and takes a daring step into progressive territory. This album was described by Melody Maker as tasteful, subtle, and refined. It was originally released in October 1970, if I'm not mistaken, and it's the uh, last album to feature guitarist uh, Anthony Phillips, and of course the only one with drummer Jonathan Mayhew. The band at this time actually had a residency at Ronnie Scott's club in Soho. And uh, interesting, a representative from Charisma Records came to see them play and noticed that there were about five members on the, st on the actual stage and about six people in the audience. Nevertheless, the band must have impressed him sufficiently because they signed the band anyway. And this music marketed departure, thankfully, from what they did on the first album to a more folk-flavoured progressive rock. This range from light acoustic pieces, uh, beautiful uh, numbers like Dusk, for example, to the heavier... A glorious apocalyptic the knife which is a is a tremendous number and this album also saw the band establish a working relationship with artist Paul Whitehead who would design a few album covers for them after this Trespass uh, features uh, fewer longer running numbers which is uh, great I think it shows a lot of ambition for a young band and certainly sees us heading towards the brilliance that would be their next album uh, there's also multiple song selections, tempo shifts and delightful instrumental passages based more around folk melodies and symphonic elements. And Gabriel's a cappella opening to Looking for Someone introduces the band's uniqueness from the get-go. His characteristic voice is not yet quite as confident as it will be, but nevertheless the, there's certainly a spark there. Phillips presents us with some wonderful guitar parts and banks, keyboards already jostling for position as a uh, primary instrument, especially on the wonderful uh, visions of angels. The album can feel a little bit barren uh, at times in parts, I think. Some sections don't seem to be entirely fleshed out. The Knife, of course, is an angrier piece with soaring organ, beautifully distorted guitars. This, in terms of brilliance, this track uh, uh, outstrips anything that has come before it. Number six is Wind and Wuthering from 1976. David Brown of the Record Mirror said that the uh, the grey, misty autumn cover gives away the mood of this record with its mellow tones and airy songs. On this in part uh, Bronte inspired foray, turbulent foray, and believe me it doesn't get more turbulent. The Bronte sisters saw Genesis take another tentative step forward after Trick of the Tail. And if that album had been very much a statement uh, from this four-piece band after the departure of Gabriel, this album was very much looking forward to it as what their identity was going to be going forward, I think. And despite the mellow tones of its cover, the working environment was anything but mellow with Hackett quitting shortly thereafter. Uh, in fact, in my opinion, I think Hackett's guitar was uh, often underused on the, his later phase tenure with this band. In fact, there have been those that have suggested that his guitar parts on Seconds Out were somewhat subdued in the mix. A lot of fans view this as the band's last prog gasp. I don't agree with that really because uh, I think there's some very nice progressive elements in a lot of their later albums even going way up into the 80s. Interestingly during these sessions for this they thrashed out Hackett's uh, Please Don't Touch uh, which would later on become his wonderful transatlantic solo album. That's what I call it anyway. But they decided not to record it after all as Collins felt that he just couldn't get behind it picking what gorilla to go with instead. Wind and Wuthering has uh, a kind of a barrenness, a moody atmospheric to it, which uh, is very much fitting with the title. A beautiful orchestral work, and Tony Banks certainly, uh, certainly asserts himself on this one. Dominating keyboards seem to be favored in the mix. Uh, Banks notches up six writing credits for the nine songs. Uh, there's no there's no doubting who is in charge here but credit where credit's due one for the vine and all in a mouse's night are remarkable remarkable numbers but overall the the band's complete sound I think as a group is better represented in the uh, uh, 11th Earl of Mar as well as the two-part instrumental unquiet slumbers for the sleepers and in that quiet earth but that particular vibe that provided a fizz and energy to Trick of the Tail is absent on this one, preferring a, preferring a much moodier and subdued feel.
and the tour opened at the Rainbow Theatre in London, featuring for the first time Chester Thompson on drums. It was his first gig with the band Hackett, uh, recalls in his autobiography. He was a great asset with his Zapper and Weather Report credentials. The buzz from the audience that night was electric. Number five is Nursery Cry from 1971. I love the dark gothic atmospheres explored in this one with the musical box and the uh, apocalyptic rampage of Herculean Mantegazzi. That's before, of course, we're taken off to ancient Greece for the Fountain of Salamassus, which uh, apparently is way too sexy for Italian radio. And this album is coloured with the Baroque guitar stylings of Steve Hackett and the excellent drumming of uh, Phil Collins, both, of course, joining the band at this juncture. Steve Hackett said of this album, the arcane world of nursery crime was full of unusual chord sequences and lyrical ideas were constantly surprising. No one else sounded quite like it. This album continues to explore the idea of the theatrical rock epic, building upon the progress the band made with the knife, delving into the dark Victoriana of Henry James and Charles Dickens, which Peter Gabriel cites as a, an influence for the musical box. This album is built around uh, three lengthy pieces punctuated by shorter tales and pleasant interludes. Interestingly, uh, Absent Friends was written by Hackett and Collins, and Hackett draws comparisons between that and the Beatles' Eleanor Rigby. The idea of structuring albums around lengthy pieces punctuated by shorter, what feels like interludes almost, was a structure that would be uh, applied to later albums as well as the band began to explore the, the dynamic range of their music and mastering that uh, build up and release of tension. I have to say Trespass, uh, when compared to Nursery Crime, seems a little bit grey. I think the musical box is one of the best things they've ever done, in my opinion. If I was doing a, a 10 best Genesis tracks, this would be right up there as far as I'm concerned. And Gabriel's voice is used exquisitely in this song, starting off with that childlike plaintive mewing, only slightly hinting at the psychosexual frenzy that was to come. And Hackett's guitar is remarkable on this. I like the fact that he's uh, using very speed recorders, has uh, recorded his guitar at half speed, so it sounds like a child's toy. A uh, musical box, in fact. A technique used by the Beach Boys with the guitar opening for Wouldn't It Be Nice. In fact, I would argue that Hackett's uh, guitar tone uh, is one of the major contributing factors to the Genesis sound, in my opinion. Um, and I love the guitar solo on Return of the Giant Hogweed. It's raw, distorted. And of course, it's there introduced that uh, famous tapping technique of his. And Gabriel's talent for storytelling really begins to rise to the fore with this album, with the use of different voices and techniques. I suppose the story of Harold the Barrel, the restaurant owner that to leaps to his death at the feet of a baying crowd. To the last track on the album, The Fountain of Salamassus, whose bombast and beautiful use of Mellotron uh, is reminiscent of King Crimson's Epitaph. A tad ironic seeing as the uh, Mellotron itself was actually purchased from uh, Robert Fripp. Number four is A Trick of the Tail from 1976. This album feels like a breath of fresh air, an exhalation after the claustrophobic and harrowing insanity of The Lamb. Interestingly, prior to this album, Chris Welsh of The Melody Maker got wind of uh, Gabriel's departure and he was uh, first to publish an article in, uh, in that newspaper saying that Genesis is dead. So this was a pretty seismic Genesis album and a damn good one at that. Louder Sound has said that uh, it is a masterful riposte to the naysayers in the immediate aftermath of Gabriel's departure. And Collins steps up magnificently, no longer, uh, no longer just being a, a kind of a, an additional vocal dynamic. He seizes the mic and takes centre stage and uh, uh, performs fantastically, as I said. Um, the group's initial impulse, I think, was to stay true to their progressive roots. I mean, let's not forget Hackett was very, still very much on board with this. Uh, and Tony Banks' playing is, is just uh, remarkable. Even if the songs uh, move away from, the, uh, the, move away from the, the narrative structure to more being uh, individual numbers based upon uh, different interesting musical explorations. Atmospherically, this album recalls selling England by the pound much more so than the, the scope and ambition of the lamb. And the material that's on offer here is, uh, appears more conventional at first, and it takes uh, some time to sink in, but when it does, I think this album is fully appreciated for what it is. 
many tracks still feature in Hackett's set list, uh, as well as Last Time Genesis went on the road. I think they included a couple of numbers from this as well. The whole atmosphere of the Genesis show changed after the Lamb tour. Um, very conscious of the fact they were missing their charismatic and chameleonic frontman. Uh, Genesis started to employ a much more elaborate light design, and Hackett and Rutherford actually stood up uh, for the performances and even engaged the audience with some in-between song chat. This album undoubtedly was a promising start for this four-man incarnation of this band. Number three is Foxtrot from 1972. Jerry Gilbert, writing for Sounds magazine, said he felt that Genesis had almost achieved the perfect album of this one. From the opening watch for the skies, the apocalyptic supper's ready, which in the words of one critic, uh, ebbs, flows, teasers and taunts, seesawing between coiled instrumental attacks and delicate pastoral fairy tales. And Peter Gabriel's gift for imagery is apparent on this album. There's some wonderful passages here, incredibly evocative. All music has said that uh, this is the rare art rock album that excels at both the art and the rock. Foxtrot opens with Watch for the Skies with the perhaps the most famous Mellotron intro ever. Well, Strawberry Fields aside, of course. Um, before it launches into the sci-fi lyric and the Morse code type beats. The title is actually taken from a, a poem by John Keats on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Oh, and then I felt like a watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. The song tells the story of a superior being that's been overlooking the planet Earth. It's based on a novel by Arthur C. Clarke called Childhood's End. We get timetable on this, which is coloured by lost ideals and Arthurian imagery, uh, perhaps foreshadowing the next album, and get them out by Friday, which is a, a wonderful use of voices as uh, Peter Gabriel channels his uh, inner Ealing comedy. And it also demonstrates that this band haven't yet dispelled with all that English whimsy. Interestingly, the song was actually inspired by Peter Rackman and his exploitation of his tenants in London during the 1950s and 1960s. And Gabriel employs many voices during this kind of kitchen sink drama. I love the authoritarian TV announcement that uh, human beings' height is to be restricted to four feet a rather Pythonesque conceptualization of the problems of overcrowding. You get the wonderful Hackett pen, the can utility in the coastline is based on the legend of a King Canute. Before that, uh, excellent uh, guitar piece, classical guitar piece, inspired by the prelude from suite number one in G major for cello by Johann Sebastian Bach. Supper's Ready is composed of seven parts all flowing seamlessly into each other. Once again, Gabriel holding it together with his uh, trademark narrative an incredible sense of intonation uh, a number based uh, upon um, john bunyan's or perhaps loosely based upon john bunyan's a pilgrim's progress uh, which would also inspire the lamb lies down on broadway seems that peter gabriel is a thing for 17th century spirituals and his voice is fabulous from delicate whispers to raspberry exuberance all adding to the character of the piece with his many character voices and costume changes Gabriel would uh, kind of demand that the live Genesis show was as much about theatre as it was about music. And as Gabriel seized the opportunity to wander on stage in a red dress and a fox's head, a pitch that soon adorned the front page of Melody Maker, Collins said that the band were able to add another zero to their booking fee. Number two is The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway from 1974. This dark, brittle, meandering labyrinth of surreal and disturbing imagery is a, a strange rendering of a Christian allegory. The lamb itself, pregnant with religious symbolism, lies down on Broadway. I mean, go figure. As a concept album, this reminds me a little bit of Alice Through the Looking Glass, as Rael is sucked into this strange world of slipper men and carpet crawlers and other strange personages. All products of Gabriel's uh, fertile, if not disturbed, imagination. Nevertheless, quality tunage abounds on this from uh, Carpet Crawlers, Fly on the Windshield, and my personal favourite, Chamber of 32 Doors. This surreal fantasia of an album is seen as a precursor to many modern uh, masterpieces like Radiohead's OK Computer and the Mars Volta's Deloused in the Comatorium, as well as uh, the F To the Flaming Lips, The Soft Bulletin. That in fact, The New Yorker said that this album was the Ulysses of concept albums. And the narrative fluctuates between first and third person uh, as the protagonist is pursued with, uh, by this wall of fog that descends on New York's 47th Street. 
all contributing stylistically and thematically to that sense of disorientation and alienation defines this album. Uh, Gabriel penned most of the lyrics, uh, apparently many of them inspired by dreams or the uh, the band, other band members who were primarily responsible for coming up with the music. Although they, although somewhat disjointed, they, they uh, gelled together surprisingly well with Banks. It is absolutely incredible, some incredible keyboard work on this album, although he has later said that he, he's not a big fan of this record. Maybe it was Brian Eno leaning over his shoulder, perhaps. But this, for me, is one of the high points of the Gabriel era, that and perhaps Up Is Ready. Phil Collins said of this album that uh, it was the best music they created and remains his favourite for the band. A defining album of the progressive genre, as far as I'm concerned. Number one is Selling England by the Pound from 1973. This is an enigmatic piece haunted by the ghosts of Edwardian England, combining pithy observations, catchy melodies, and exquisite arrangements. It is a meditation on Englishness, but a rather oblique study, I feel, where the dreams of merry old England are corrupted by the forces of change, what Thomas Hardy would describe as the ache of modernism. When performing Dancing with the Moonlit Night, Gabriel in full Britannia costume would announce, I am in the English Channel, it is cold and wet. I am the voice of Britain before the Daily Express. My name is Britannia and this is my song. This album is a whimsical meditation on national identity, a pastoral yearning exploring uh, the desire to return to uh, a bygone age. An English mythos and identity critiqued, I feel. It's quite a poignant album, really, as it blends Arthurian legend with medieval minstrelsy, and even more significant, I suppose, now politically, post-Brexit, and when, when many European countries themselves are wanting to redefine themselves along nationalistic lines. England as a concept as the old order is in decline. I drew comparisons between the idea or themes of this album and the kinks so We Are Village Green Preservation Society. I even put that to Steve Hackett in my last interview with him. Of course, Ray Davis also produces these wonderful vignettes on the nature of Englishness uh, viewed sardonically via the medium of these little rituals, potted jams and summer fates. Genesis, by contrast, employs much broader strokes here, where rock and folk modalities morph into this grand Elga-esque canvas. This feels like a band uh, playing and uh, with one shared vision, playing in unison. I think Hackett has said that this uh, was the happiest time uh, with this band, I think. And his guitar playing on Fur for Fifth is just absolutely sublime, blending beautifully with uh, Banks' keyboard work on here as well, especially that remarkable classical piano opening. This album is a blend of theatrical compositions blended with magnificent uh, musical passages. I mean, there's something pastoral, almost churchy, in the music of Genesis, and that's never more apparent than on this record. Interestingly, the cover was a painting by Betty Swanick, who was a member of the Royal Academy. She didn't have time to conceive and paint a completely new work, so she appropriated a famous painting called The Dream, just adding a lawnmower to reference uh, one of the most famous songs of the Gabriel era. In my opinion, Selling England by the Pound uh, counts among the greatest greatest of 70s progressive rock albums. So there you are, my long anticipated ranking of the albums of Genesis. I hope you feel it was worth the wait. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. If you're still watching and you haven't switched off. I'd like to thank you for doing just that. And anyway, it just leaves me to close with my usual salvo, which of course is hope you're all staying well and healthy. But more importantly is that you keep listening.